session. Um, the first talk is on circuit compilers with logarithmic leakage rate by Martin Andrejovic, uh, Stefan Jabowski, and Sebastian Faust, and Sebastian will give the talk. Okay, so, okay, that's great. So, okay, uh, thanks a lot for uh, the introduction. Uh, so, this is a joint work with Martin and Stefan, or Martin and Stefan, and um, I will talk about essentially the black box model first. So, we have uh, in the black box model, I think it's too loud, no, or not? It sounds very loud. Yeah? Oh. So, in the black box model, we have essentially uh, this adversary, and what you can do is you can attack the black box, and as all models, also in models in cryptography, the black box model makes some uh, restrictions about what the adversary can do. So what we usually assume in the black box model is that there is some source of perfect randomness from which we, for example, sample the secret key. So we have this key that comes from this perfect source of randomness. This perfect randomness is also used, for example, when the algorithm is executed. For example, when we do some encryption, we need some perfect source of randomness. And then there's this adversary, and the second kind of assumption, and that's also why this model is called black box model, is that this adversary, he can interact with this algorithm over some well-defined interface. So you can think of this, for example, as an encryption scheme. Now what the adversary can do is provide some input message M, and then what he gets back is a ciphertext, for example. Well, other types of interfaces are possible, of course. And it's called black box model because whatever, the adversary, whatever happens inside this uh, box here, the adversary has absolutely no knowledge about this. So in particular, he doesn't see, he doesn't have inf in any information about the secret key. Okay. So <coughs> most of the security proofs, they are done in this uh, black box model. So we show that it's impossible for an adversary to break the, the algorithm uh, the as long as the key is perfectly random and the at attacker only has access to the algorithm. So the question is, is this unbreakable? So of course, uh, it turns out that in many cases, in, uh, it's not unbreakable in which this algorithm can be used. For example, when we implement it on some smart card, then the adversary can do, can kind of move from this world here, where he lives, to the outside world, to, to the non-black box world, let's say like this, and then he can try to uh, exploit some weaknesses of the, the implementation. There are many examples. So one important example, which is also the most important for this talk, is where essentially adversaries try to break smart cards. So they measure some side channel information and try to uh, like break the algorithm. And these side channel attacks, they're typically much, much more efficient than the traditional attacks against the algorithm. Okay, so what is the problem? This essentially this adversary moves outside of this black box world. He moves to this, well, to exploit some weaknesses of the, of, the, of the implementation. And he can, for example, like measure side channel information that emits from this executing this device. And that's usually called the leakage. So there are many examples, and I guess maybe some of you have seen the talk of Emmanuel yesterday. So I give like very high level idea, not only about this uh, power analysis attack. So uh, essentially one source of this leakage is uh, the power consumption of the device. So we have this RSA decryption, for example, it computes C to the D mod N. And what it does is uh, using a square and multiply algorithm, for example, when you implement it on some real world device. <coughs> and then the adversary, when he gets access, uh, physical access to this device, he can measure the power consumption of a uh, device. So he can like, for example, get this power trace here. And if uh, the power consumption is different, if the power consumption is different uh, for squaring or multiplication, and since whether we execute a squaring or multiplication depends on the bit representation of this secret key, the adversary can just by looking at this power trace reveal the, the secret, okay? So there have many countermeasures been proposed, so there are like two classes of countermeasures, so physical countermeasures and uh, like algorithmic countermeasures. So I will only talk about the algorithmic countermeasures and there are like also two variants, so we could like try to design specific schemes that protect against these uh, uh, side channel attacks, so we can design like a leakage resilient PRF or puppy key encryption or signature, or we can aim for something much more ambitious, namely trying to protect arbitrary computation. Okay, so this is a general protection mechanism now, and this is also the focus of this goal, and we want to essentially uh, protect arbitrary computation, so we need some way to model arbitrary computation, and we do this as a circuit. So the circuit has some operations, like a multiplication operation, addition operation, there are some wires in the circuit, and these uh, wires carry some elements in a finite field, F. Okay? 
So this is how we model arbitrary computation. So this could be, for example, an AES circuit, has some secret key here, some input there, and produce some output. <coughs> so the most famous general protection mechanism is this uh, so-called masking schemes, and there's like a lot of work on this, so starting with this work of Shari et al. from Crypto 99. And now in the last years, they have much more work uh, on this topic, like trying to uh, get more efficient schemes or schemes that are like provide higher resilience against uh, certain types of attacks. And <coughs> essentially the idea of the schemes is as follows. So you have like some description as a circuit and we transform it into a new protected circuit that hopefully is, uh, is a protected circuit description that hopefully has better security against uh, realistic side channel attacks. So uh, this was formalized, this concept was formalized by ISW uh, and, uh, as a circuit compiler who also pro produced uh, or like introduced the leakage model. So this is uh, the, the, the work that inspired many of these follow-up works. And essentially the circuit compiler takes as input some arbitrary circuit, like for example an AES, and then produces a protected circuit description that hopefully gives better resilience against like power analysis attacks. And then we can implement this protected circuit description on some real world device like some smart card. And the hope is now if this adversary obtains some leakage, then he cannot break the scheme anymore. Okay. So this is kind of this. And uh, so the leakage model that was considered by ISW uh, is essentially the so-called T-probing model. And the nice thing about this T-probing model is uh, two things. So first, it's very simple. So it's very simple to describe and also argue about security uh, About security in this model is relatively easy. So there are even like now automatic tools who check this uh, security of these uh, masking schemes in this model. And uh, they are also quite realistic because they model some rel uh, relevant side channel attacks. So what does this T-probing model say? It says essentially the adversary can like learn some of the intermediate values that are produced by the circuit. For example, here he could learn some bit of the secret key or here some output of the addition gate. And uh, the only restriction that we do is that he is bounded to learn up to T intermediate uh, values. <coughs> and uh, pro, uh, security of this uh, ma of a masking scheme essentially guarantees you that as long as the adversary is restricted to only learn T intermediate values, he learns nothing about the values that are on which we actually compute. And typically we aim here for perfect security, so we want to have a perfect simulator that can simulate the view of the adversary. Okay, so this is typically what's done. And there are two variants, so one is where we uh, talk about absolute leakage and the other one about uh, relative leakage. So uh, they were both introduced in this work of ISW and I want to show you what's the difference between these two models now. Okay. So the first one, the absolute leakage model, it puts a bound on the total number T of probes in the circuit. So that's uh, like a total restriction uh, what the adversary can learn. And you can see the following example. So we have a circuit, a small circuit with 300 wires, the big circuit with 30,000 wires, but the T stays in both cases the same. So in both cases, even though the circuit is now much larger, the adversary can only learn three intermediate values. Okay. So the main disadvantage of this uh, approach is that the T stays the same even if this circuit gets larger and larger. And this is in particular a problem for these compilers because usually these compilers, they make, they first blow up the, si the circuit by a large factor, by a security parameter or like a polynomial in the security parameter. This circuit, the protected circuit becomes larger. Okay. <coughs> the other model uh, looks at the fraction of the leaking wires. It was also considered by the ISW work. And essentially now uh, it introduces this parameter alpha, which is uh, essentially T divided by the size of the circuit. So T is the number of probes and the size, well, it's the number of wires or the number of gates essentially. And uh, in this case, we want essentially, if we have a small circuit, the adversary can learn here three wires. We have like leakage rate of 1%, while here the adversary can learn like now 300 wires. So we have a leakage rate of uh, still 1%. So we want that essentially the, yeah, the leakage rate stays uh, the same with the size of the circuit, even if the size of the circuit increases. This is at least the final goal. Not going to, we are not going fully achieving it yet, but this is the final goal. Okay. So the state of the art for perfect security of ISW was uh, to achieve alpha uh, one divided by n, where n is the security parameter. And I <coughs> will, like this approximate means usually that there will be some small constant hidden in this uh, 
uh, one divided by n. Okay? So uh, this was the state of the art, and what we achieve now in our result is the following, essentially. We try to aim to maximize this rate alpha. We have a construction for affine circuits, so where the circuits only contain addition and multiplication by a constant, which achieves actually this optimal rate, so alpha equal to one divided by t. Uh, <coughs> the main ingredient is some asymptotical optimal refreshing scheme to achieve this. Uh, and we have also results for arbitrary circuits, where now uh, the circuit can also contain, uh, for example, a multiplication, uh, and then we achieve a rate of one divided by log n, where n is the security parameter. So the rest of this talk is structured as follows. I will talk a bit more how these masking, scheme works, masking schemes work, then uh, talk about this affine circuits and also how to lift it to uh, work for all circuit circuits. So <coughs> what is uh, the ingredients of such a masking scheme? There are essentially three ingredients that we always need to get a secure scheme. The first one is uh, an encoding function. So and that's also where this parameter n comes from. Uh, so this encoding function maps an element in the field to a vector over this field. And uh, so essentially you can think of this as a linear secret sharing scheme, so an n out of n secret sharing scheme, where the element b, the secret element from the field, is encoded by a vector b1 to bn that is uniformly distributed over f of n, su uh, f, f to the n, uh, such that uh, the sum of the shares is equal to b. So this is just like a normal, simple additive secret sharing scheme. And as long as you only learn like uh, n minus one shares, you have no knowledge about the secret b. And then that's, the, that's uh, now the, the first, the main, so this is kind of trivial, so the, the first uh, main uh, difficulty is to actually come up with some operations that compute on these encoding schemes. So we need like these kind of gadgets, they are were called by, by ISW. And uh, such a gadget it takes as input some encoding of some secret value A and encoding of some secret value B and produces an encoding of A plus B. And it has to be done in such a way that it's secure, it preserves the security of this encoding. And for the addition, this is actually simple. We can just do, because this, this secret sharing is linear, we can just do like a component-wise addition. Okay? And then the third thing is that we need some kind of method of composition. So we need some way to actually, uh, like if you have a large circuit, now to compose all these simple gadgets in such a way that security is uh, preserved. And usually uh, this composition is done by a gate by gadget, comp like replacement strategy. So you have like some circuit, the unprotected, that you want to uh, compile. There are many gates in it, and each of these uh, gates is replaced by some gadget, by some protected gadget. Okay. <coughs> so let's uh, take these ingredients and now look at a circuit uh, that is composed of many uh, gates. Uh, so we get like kind of like now some huge circuit and which computes on encodings. It has some addition gates here, some protected multiplication gates. Maybe there's some protected multiplication by a constant gate also, which we need for our fine circuits. And there's some secret state, K1 to Kn, K1 prime to Kn prime. Maybe this would be like an abstract uh, view on the AES circuit, okay? So there's some secret there. And uh, there's also some encoding and some output decoding. Okay. And you see here, these are these fat wires here, and these fat wires now contain essentially encodings. So for example, this fat wire here would contain the encoding of A plus K. So the first question, we want to like uh, achieve a good rate, so the, the rate should grow with the size of the circuit. And uh, in particular, it could happen that uh, since this is the security parameter, we could look at circuits that are much larger than n, okay? So in this case, uh, of course, we want that the t can be larger than the n, but is this possible? It turns out that, of course, it's not possible. If the adversary can, like, target here one encoding uh, by putting all the probes here, he can essentially learn the entire secret, and uh, we cannot have a perfect simulation. So. ISW, to this end, introduced some uh, restriction of what the adversary can do. They introduced this so-called T-region probing model, and this model essentially we structured the computation in so-called regions. Each region is represented by some of the gates, uh, gadgets, and the adversary can place T probes inside this. Okay? So if the gadgets are large enough, then uh, we can still hope for a very good uh, rate. And the main ingredient to achieve a security or to get a composed circuit that is uh, like uh, secure in the end is some kind of method to refreshing. So why do we need this refreshing routine? Because you can think of this addition gate I showed you already. 
it was completely deterministic, and if we have a like, large number of addition gates, then uh, if the adversary can in each of these addition gates probe like T wires, then at some point you can still recover, for example, the entire secret key. So we need some way to pump new randomness into the encoding. And that's <coughs> essentially done by this uh, refreshing algorithm. And this refreshing algorithm uh, works on a high level like this. We have, uh, we have essentially some input encoding K1 to Kn and produce some output encoding H1 to Hn. And internally, this guy uses some uh, randomness. Okay? The first requirement that we want is correctness. So if this was an encoding of K, then the output would also be an encoding of K. Okay? So this is the correctness requirement. And we will use, of course, the randomness now such that this encoding will be independent of this encoding. Second requirement is the, the security requirement. So we want that when we allow in each of these executions of the refreshing, the adversary to place T probes, then, uh, or like, yeah, and, and where T has to be smaller than n half, then he should not learn anything about the uh, secret uh, K that was encoded here. So why is n half, uh, why n half? Because we can probe some, uh, s some fraction of the output encoding we can learn here, and then some, uh, some other fraction of the, the shares we could learn here. So if this would, T would be equal to n half, then we can, of course, again, learn the entire encoding and recover the secret. So that's why we need T smaller than n half. <coughs> and the main ingredient to build such a scheme is this encoding of zero sampler. So essentially, we, this is where the randomness is used. We generate an encoding of zero by sampling R1 to Rn, and then by just adding this to the input encoding. And the security of this refreshing follows essentially from the security of this encoding of zero sampler. So what does this encoding of zero sampler, or what does security of an encoding of zero sampler say? Essentially, we have here this uh, sampler that produces this distribution, uh, R1 to Rn, which is an encoding of zero. The adversary can place some uh, probes inside here, and what we want in the end, that still a large fraction of these outputs are independent of the internal probes. And so that's what we want. Uh, some simple way to do this is to sample R1 to Rn minus 1 uniformly at random, and then computing R1 Rn as the sum, the negative sum of, of the shares. Uh, unfortunately, this simple encoding of zero sampler doesn't satisfy this uh, property that I just described. And moreover, if you instantiate uh, like a refreshing scheme using this sampler, then the scheme becomes actually insecure. And the best uh, secure refreshing uh, that achieves perfect security uh, is uh, due to ISW, which has O of n square size and leakage rate of alpha equal to or approximately 1 divided by n. Uh, so how can we improve this? So essentially, we improve this by viewing the encoding of zero sampler as a graph where the output uh, is represented by these vertices here. So we have R1, R2, R3, R4, R5. These are like uh, the outputs that are produced by this encoding of zero sampler. And the edges are the internal randomness that I used for uh, the sampling. Okay? So now, for example, here, this would be a simple encoding of zero sampler where we sample A, B, C, D uniformly at random. And then we uh, add to the, so R1 becomes essentially the sum of all these shares. And then R2, R3, R4, and R5 as the negative of uh, these, uh, these uh, random values. And then it's clear, clear that now when we add all these values together, we get an encoding of zero. Okay? So the ISW encoding of zero sampler can be essentially viewed as a fully connected graph. So that's why also this uh, complexity is O of n square. Okay? And now probing is essentially corresponds to removing edges in this graph. Okay? So when we, for example, here we had like V and C, when the adversary learns this, then we remove uh, these edges in this graph. So uh, recall what we wanted to have the, for the, this encoding of zero sampler. We want that a large fraction of our, our eyes is independent of the probes, which uh, corresponds in this graph uh, viewing approach uh, to essentially that this graph, after removing uh, some of the edges, has still a large connected component. And we need for security that this connected component contains at least, least n half of the vertices. So this is the connected component here in this case, after probing many of the internal randomness. And now, to get a good encoding of zero sampler, what we need essentially is for security, we need a graph that initially is very highly connected. And to have an efficient sampler, we need some graph, uh, we need a sparse graph. So we can use an extender graph, uh, essentially, and then this gives us uh, then an encoding of zero. 
So what is the result uh, that we get? Finally, there is, uh, we show that there exists an explicit construction of refreshing for size and randomness complexity of O of n, and uh, the security it achieves uh, also constant fraction of probes security. So and then can be instantiated with some expanders like this Magulis expander graph. And what we get in total is uh, then a probing rate since the size is O of n and the rate, uh, the, the number of probes is smaller than constant fraction, then we get uh, one divided by C probing rate. So uh, then we can combine this with, uh, for affine circuits with this addition gate, for example. The addition gate has like complexity O of n. So we get in total a circuit that has size O of n in, in this we can probe like a constant fraction, in this we can probe a constant fraction, so we get like a constant fraction of uh, probing attack uh, possibility. So now uh, for the multiplication, for the multiplication ISW achieves uh, one divided by n leakage rate, and uh, what we do essentially to uh, improve this leakage rate is using some techniques for multi-party computation. So instead of computing on the simple additive secret sharing, we compute on uh, like some threshold secret sharing, so a T out of N secret sharing, for example, Shami secret sharing, where essentially A is represented by these shares A1 to AN that are different points on a polynomial of degree T smaller than N half. And uh, so in the following, I denote this by this kind of notation, which is due to this paper of Damgard, Ishai, Kolgard, I think, which essentially says that there's N shares and they lie on a polynomial of degree T. And uh, in this work of uh, Andrei Shovitz et al, it was shown that if we have like some leak-free component here that samples us some uh, like a Shamir secret sharing or some encoding a threshold secret sharing of a, s a random value R lying on a polynomial of degree T and a uh, uh, random sharing of the same value R lying now on a degree of polynomial uh, on a polynomial of degree 2T, if you can generate them somehow in a secure way, then we can actually achieve optimal leakage rate of one divided by C okay, for the multiplication. So what we observe now is that uh, we can actually eliminate this leak-free component by observing that this sampling here is actually an affine circuit. So this can be described by an affine circuit. And then we can use our affine compiler to transform it into uh, like a larger circuit that now computes on encodings of these uh, Shamir or like threshold secret sharings. And what we get is essentially output of an encoding of uh, this R of uh, sub n comma t and uh, R n sub uh, sub n comma 2t. Okay. So the one difficulty to continue this computation, so this actually achieves the optimal probing uh, rate security, but now to continue this computation, we need to decode these, uh, we, need to, we need to peel off one layer of encoding. So we have some kind of circuit that does this, but this is the, pr the, pla the place where we lose a factor of uh, uh, one divided by log n. Okay, so this is a still open question how to get this also to constant. So we can then show that uh, the whole circuit uh, achieves like uh, security for a rate one divided by log n. And um, to summarize, since I don't have any time anymore, I guess. Yeah. So uh, we can uh, have for affine security uh, optimal leakage rate one divided by c for some constant c we can have for any circuit security one divided by log n leakage rate. Uh, this refreshing achieves size and random complexity of O of n and has uh, tolerates a number, uh, 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 number of probes of O of n. This may be even like interesting for other settings like for composition. We usually need also refreshing to achieve, uh, to protect against certain types of attacks. So we can maybe use this to get more efficient schemes. And uh, also it has nice implication to this very important work of Proof and Rivain uh, on uh, the noisy leakage model, because we can have a, like this kind of rate here, uh, we can actually show that we can in the end achieve security for optimal noise rate one divided by some constant C. That concludes my talk, thanks a lot. Uh, I think in order to stay on schedule, we'll have to take questions offline because we'll ah, really? be synchronized with the Okay. With the other room. Thank you. But we anyway have to change this thing so I, they can ask me questions. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> if stay